was the first country to undergo an industrial revolution and it began in the 18th century in the English countryside. Now we've come to accept the term industrial revolution even though it implies something rather sudden, dramatic and indeed even overnight. But of course it was not like that. Nevertheless, the social, economic and technological changes were to have very far-reaching implications for how people lived and worked. Now, what are the essential elements of an industrial revolution? Now, of course, like any human achievement, it can be a very complex interaction of influences and motives. But certainly we could, I think, isolate three. One, perhaps firstly, is a growth in population which gives rise to much greater markets and demands on the productive industries to meet those markets. It also presupposes a certain amount of surplus risk capital and indeed the desire and willingness to invest that capital in a technologically innovative industry. Now in 18th century Britain and in the early part of the 19th century there were indeed rather dramatic changes in the harnessing of energy to industrial purposes, the development of transport routes, and indeed the development and application of new constructive materials. Now it has been claimed that Britain and therefore the world's first industrial revolution began here in Shropshire. And in this program we shall investigate that claim and assess the contribution made by the iron workers of Colebrookdale to the world's first industrial revolution. Colebrookdale is a tributary valley to the River Severn and the Colebrook stream runs down through the ironworks site to join the Severn just a mile to the south. Now apart from water power, the ironworks is in other ways very favourably sited with all the necessary materials readily to hand. Timber from the Ironbridge Gorge and from the Rekin, just two miles to the northwest, limestone from Wenlock Edge, and iron ore, clay, and coal, all available in the immediate vicinity. Now, even given these supply of materials, it was the skills in working the iron that made Colebrookdale known throughout the world. Now, if we're to understand the significance of this site, I think we need to ask ourselves two questions. Firstly, what was it that happened here at the beginning of the 18th century which was to change so dramatically the British ironworks industry and to open up such enormous possibilities for using iron in engineering and architecture? Secondly, why did it happen here in Colebrookdale first rather than anywhere else? To understand the first question, we should look at the state of the 17th century iron industry in Britain and indeed know just a little of how the iron industry works. Now, iron, like all constructional and decorative materials, is found in the ground. In fact, about 5% of the Earth's crust is pure iron. Iron ore, as extracted from the ground, uh, contains iron in combination with oxygen and other earthy clay materials which are not required. So that after mining the iron ore, the first process is one of separating the relatively pure iron from all the surrounding dross. This process is called smelting and it requires a furnace which can reach the melting point of iron, which is very high, in fact 1535 degrees centigrade. To smelt the iron, the ore has to be placed in contact with a hot fire of carbon material in order to run out usable molten iron. The device in which this is done is called a blast furnace, in which a blast of air is blown through the base of the fire to raise it to that high required temperature. Now, this technique had been used for centuries. Until the beginning of the 18th century, the source of carbon in the blast furnace had always been charcoal made by the controlled burning of timber. The typical 17th century ironworks, therefore, would be located in areas where there was a plentiful supply of iron ore, in well-wooded or forested areas to supply the charcoal, 
and on a river or a stream which would provide not only the power to drive the blast engines but also as a transport route for the heavy products of the foundry. These favourable conditions were found, for example, in the Weald of Sussex, in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire, and here at Colebrookdale. Iron had been smelted here in charcoal furnaces for a long time when Abraham Darby arrived here from Bristol at the beginning of the 18th century. He was an experimenter, and in 1709, he made the major breakthrough when he was the first person successfully to smelt iron ore using coke instead of charcoal in the blast furnace. And it was done in this very furnace. Now, why was this change in the source of carbon in the blast furnace so important? The answer really lies in the different structural strength between charcoal and coke. Charcoal, as you know, can be crushed between finger and thumb, whereas coke has a very much greater resistance to being crushed. I'm now inside Abraham Darby's original Colebrookdale blast furnace. And it was the structural weakness of the charcoal firebed which severely limited the charge of iron ore and limestone which could be packed in from the top, and yet still allow the air blast from the bottom here to pass up through the firebed and out at the top. Too great a charge and the charcoal would crush, pack down tight, and simply put out the fire. Coke, on the other hand, could sustain a much greater charge and still allow spaces for the air blasts to pass through. Now, I think it would be easier to understand the process if we look at a model of the blast furnace. A blast furnace produces a quantity of molten iron in batches. That is, the furnace is charged with the ingredients from the top, fired, put in blast for the required time, and then the molten iron tapped at the bottom. The material which emerges from the blast furnace is known as cast iron and will flow easily into moulds of various shapes. If it is not to be cast into products immediately on leaving the furnace, it is allowed to flow along runnels or channels in the floor and then into branch channels. Because these branch channels resemble piglets suckling their mother, the material also became known as pig iron. These solid ingots, or pigs of iron, are of manageable size and can be transported to foundries remote from the iron ore areas where they can be remelted and cast into a variety of products. The weight of a batch of molten iron, which can be tapped from the base of the blast furnace here, is very much greater when coke is used in the blast furnace for those fundamental structural reasons given earlier. Now, there are two benefits arising from this greater batch quantity. One is, of course, that the cost of iron becomes very much cheaper per tonne. And the second, equally important, is that very much larger castings can be made. When making an article in cast iron, it first of all has to be made full size in wood. This wooden model is called a pattern. To make a gear wheel, for example, like this, a wooden pattern has first to be made. This is then pressed down into the sand mould, very carefully withdrawn, and the shape that's left in the sand is then filled with molten iron. Both the pattern making process and the moulding process are highly skilled activities. So to summarise then, what happened here was a subtle change, an apparently subtle change, in the source of carbon in the blast furnace and a change in blast furnace management techniques. It made cast iron cheaper and for the first time a major competitor to traditional building materials in engineering and architecture. Large castings could be made and it became possible for the first time to think of making structures larger than the domestic scale. In fact, it's possible to make a bridge of iron. Now, why did it happen here in the Dale? Darby, of course, inherited a successful working charcoal-based ironworks, but which was also located in the Shropshire coal field. 
And here, Derby was particularly fortunate. Shropshire coal is very low in sulphur, and the coke that's made from such coal is absolutely perfect for iron castings. So the techniques that occurred here in the beginning of the 18th century were one of the major springboards for the Industrial Revolution and were to make the products of this iron foundry known throughout the world. Following their success with coke smelting of iron, the Coalbrookdale Company greatly developed their range of cast iron products during the 18th and 19th centuries and were associated with many of those major technological developments which characterised the Industrial Revolution. These developments included the introduction of iron into mills and millwork, the evolution of the steam engine, the use of iron in bridges and aqueducts, as well as for structural and architectural uses in buildings. Colbrookdale was also associated with the world's first cast iron rails in the pre-locomotive age and with the first generation of steam locomotives. Iron was soon to replace timber in shipbuilding and the Colbrookdale Company supplied the iron for Brunel's SS Great Britain which was launched in Bristol in 1843. In addition to all this, the company also developed an extensive range of domestic and art castings. A very early use for the cheaper, coke smelted cast iron quickly suggested itself. This was the casting of the metal cylinders for the Newcomen atmospheric engine which had emerged at the beginning of the 18th century. This is not surprising when you consider that the developments in smelting of which we have been speaking occurred at Colbrookdale in 1709 and the world's first working atmospheric beam engine was installed in 1712 to pump water from the Earl of Dudley's coal mine in Staffordshire. Just three years and 15 miles separated these two events which were together to form one of the mainsprings of the Industrial Revolution. The 21 inch diameter cylinder for this first engine at Dudley was cast in brass but cast iron quickly superseded this material. And the established expertise in hollow casting in sand of the Colbrookdale Company made them the obvious choice for the rising generation of steam engine builders. This first engine developed about four and a half horsepower at 12 strokes per minute and was the prototype of the many others designed to meet the energy demands of the Industrial Revolution. But undoubtedly the most famous product of the Colbrookdale Ironworks is the iron bridge itself. It was the world's first bridge to be made in iron and designed to carry road traffic. The proposal for a bridge crossing the River Severn here was first made in 1773 in a letter from a Shrewsbury architect, Thomas Farnells Pritchard, to a local ironmaster, John Wilkinson. The scheme was discussed subscribers were found and a design made to quote a bridge of very curious construction. Abraham Darby agreed to build the bridge. It's cast in many pieces up at the Colbrookdale site and moved down here to the assembly site just one mile to the south. The largest single casting is this half rib here and it weighs just under six tons, a remarkable feat for open sand casting in the 18th century. The masonry was brought up to the level I'm standing on now and then began the very complex process of assembling the ribs, slotting together in a three-dimensional jigsaw form the various individual castings. There are four parallel ribs forming the bridge and they span 100 feet. The interesting thing is that the bridge itself was a legend in its own lifetime and in the late 18th century visitors from all over the world visited this wonderful spectacle of the ironmaster's art and also to visit the burning fiery furnaces of the Shropshire landscape. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just over a decade after the completion of the Iron Bridge, cast iron began in the 1790s to replace traditional building materials in the textile mills and warehouses which were increasingly required as the factory system developed. Now cast iron is much stronger in compression than it is in tension and it was therefore first used in 1792 to make building columns and in the early examples was used in conjunction with timber beams. However, in this building of 1796, cast iron beams were also used to support the fireproof floors. It is a flax mill built in Shrewsbury and is the oldest surviving example of a building with an internal metal frame. The architectural use of cast iron developed rapidly and it made it possible to prefabricate a building where the cast elements from the foundry were delivered to the site for assembly. The largest and perhaps best known example of this form of construction was the Great Crystal Palace of 1851, designed to house the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations, built in Hyde Park in London. Prefabricated framed buildings became popular in the 19th century and many examples survive, such as churches, museums, conservatories, and even complete cast iron shop fronts, and of course, railway stations. The Cobrookdale Company was also involved in the very earlier stages of the railway system in Britain, long before the steam locomotive age, in fact. The very first cast iron wheels for wagons were made here at the foundry in 1729, and in 1767, they made the world's first cast iron rails for use within the foundry site itself. And at the beginning of the 19th century, Richard Trevithick, the Cornish railway locomotive pioneer, came here to Colbrookdale with his ideas and drawings and discussed them with the Derby iron founders. And as a result, the foundry here built the world's very first steam locomotive in 1802. I'm standing on the footplate of a works built locomotive number five, Colebrookdale locomotive number five. It is one of six which were built for use within the foundry here, which were built between 1864 and 1866. Decorative art in cast iron was probably at its peak at the time of the Great Exhibition of 1851, at which the Colebrookdale Company had products on display. For example, these cast iron decorative gates were exhibited and they remain in Hyde Park to this day. Also exhibited was this drinking fountain which is a good example of the art casting which was also functional. It is now on display at the Museum of Iron at Colebrookdale. Other examples of the company's art work remain as street furniture such as this fountain statue decorative lamp standards, and this statue, known as the Eagle Slayer, which was also exhibited at the Great Exhibition, but is now at the Bethnal Green Museum in London. Other Colebrookdale castings were merely decorative. But the domestic, utilitarian items in their catalogue, like this cooking range, were steady revenue earners for the company over a very long period. As we have seen, it was the Colebrookdale Ironworks Company itself which demonstrates so many of those features of a successful industrial revolution. They had a good, adventurous management over a very long period. In fact, five generations of the Derby Quaker family, that dynasty of iron founders as they came to be known. They were closely involved with their skilled workforce in the Dale. But being Quakers, although there are no portraits or statues of the members of the family, there are still many reminders of the Derbys in the day or today. The company itself had an impressive list of firsts in technology, as we have seen. But perhaps it is the Iron Bridge itself that best represents that change in scale of production made possible in 1709 by that first successful smelting of iron using coke. And this, perhaps above all other events, 
is Colebrookdale's contribution to that change of pace and pattern of life which we have come to know as the Industrial Revolution. <laughs>